Good afternoon. Let me try that again. My name is Jennifer Wilkes, and I'm delighted to welcome you in my capacity as director of UT Austin's John L. Warfield Center for African and African American Studies. Before continuing, I want to acknowledge that those of us who are joining from North America are on the indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for what is now called North America. Moreover, I would like to acknowledge the Alabama Cushada, Cado, Carrizo Come Crudo, Kualuitecan, Comanche, Kickapoo, Lipan Apache, Tonkawa, and Isleta del Sur Pueblo, and all the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been or have become a part of these lands and territories in Texas. This gathering would not have been possible without Warfield Center Senior Program Coordinator Christina Bryant and Graduate Assistant Alex Cunningham. Please join me in thanking them for their work uh, organizing this event. Today, the Warfield Center is honored to celebrate the publication of Performing Power in Nigeria, Identity, Politics, and Pentecostalism by faculty affiliate, Dr. Abimola Adelakun. Dr. Adelakun is an assistant professor in the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies at UT Austin, where she earned her PhD in theater and dance, along with a doctoral portfolio in African and African Diaspora Studies. She holds two MAs, one from UT Austin in African and African Diaspora Studies, and the other from University of Ibadan in Communication and Language Arts. Dr. Adela Kuhn studies modern African cultures as they are lived and performed through the disciplinary lenses of performance, gender, Africana, and Yoruba studies. Her research has been supported by the John L. Warfield Center, the Mellon School of Theater and Performance Research at Harvard University, the American Association of University Women International, and the Francis and Sanger Massacre Chair in the Humanities. She is the winner of the 2018 Wangari Matai Award for Scholarship and Leadership Excellence. Joining Dr. De La Kuhn in conversation is Dr. Nimi Wariboko, the Walter G. Mulder Professor of Social Ethics in the School of Theology at Boston University. A lively transdisciplinary thinker, Dr. Wariboko loves to unfold, refold, enfold, and energize past and present ideas and hopes in relation to the possibilities of future human flourishing. The five pillars of his scholarship are economic ethics, Christian social ethics, African social traditions, Pentecostal studies, and philosophical theology. The structure of this creative body of work, which is characterized by rigorous interweaving of original insights from each of these fields, is mapped out by the, five, uh, the following five central titles. The principle of excellence, a framework for social ethics, God and Money, a Theology of Money in a Globalizing World, Ethics and Time, Ethos of Temporal Orientation in Politics and Religion of the Niger Delta, The Pentecostal Principle, Ethical Methodology in New Spirit, and Economics in Spirit and Truth, a Moral Philosophy of Finance. Our featured conversation will be followed by an open question and answer session, and you can use the chat box in the menu at the bottom of the screen to share your questions. Until then, please join me in welcoming Drs. Abibola Adela Kuhn and Mimi Wariboko to the virtual stage. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilkins. You are muted. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, I said thank you everybody and I will speak first. I'm sharing my screen so that everybody can, uh, can see the screen. So that as I read, I want you to follow me. And then after my speaking, um, that I, 
Adelako will, will come up. So the title of my response to the book is Poetics and Fragility of Pentecostal Identity, Reflections on Adelako's Performing Power in Nigeria. This book provides an interpretative map for understanding how Nigerian Pentecostalism obsessively seeks spiritual power, performs political power, and incarnates domineering social power as, as its most visceral, veritable, and alluring identity. This is a rich and theoretically astute political analysis of Nigerian Pentecostals offered through a sophisticated lens of performance studies. In the fields of global Pentecostalism and world Christianity, Adelaku gives us one of the first real detailed performance studies inflated, inflated ethnographies. This work situates ethnographic accounts performatively and embeds performance studies in ethnography. The book makes substantial contribution to the socio-scientific historical and philosophical understanding of Pentecostalism. The, the scholarship is sound and transdisciplinary. The book is theoretically informed and has good grasps of most of the works of the leading experts in the, in the relevant areas of research. She demonstrates in this book that she can hold a single thought, a multi-layer thesis in a systematic and coherent manner over hundreds of pages of rigorous and careful discussions as she unfolds, refolds, and, of, and enfolds ideas and arguments about identity and power in Nigerian Pentecostalism. This makes it easy to follow our arguments and they consistently draw the reader into the evocative powers of our prose and the sheer brilliance of our thesis. Now, a critical examination of the book's thesis. The thesis is simple. The thesis is simply this. Nigerian Pentecostal pursue the accusation of spiritual power as their paramount goal, and power has become their identity. Power in Nigerian Pentecostal movement has three dimensions. A, the movement's goal, conditions of its existence, B, and C, its identity. These three coexist, co-function, and are mutually determining. Identity is the transformation of goal, ambition, and the conditions of existence into a state of self-presentation or self-recognition. Goals and conditions are reciprocal presupposition and together in turn are, 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 and together are in turn driven, drawn or diagrammed and performatively enacted by identity. In sum, identity not only points to the goal, the ongoing desire and conditions of existence of Nigerian Pentecostal, but also participate in their power and glory. Take, for instance, a flag as a symbol of a nation. It does not merely point to the nation, but also participate in the power and the glory of the nation it identifies with. Nigerian Pentecostals not, are not only a sign of God's power, but they see themselves as a symbol of God's power. Power and maintenance of power is their identity. The seeker of power turns power into the identity and even becomes power itself. The identity seeker becomes the identity itself. Let me elucidate, elucidate our thesis as captured in the last two sentences by drawing from African social tradition and Western philosophy. And I will call this that essay genealogy of Adela Cruz's thesis. And now to make it understandable to Africans who are listening and others, that's it. That the hand, I will use the title, the hand and the African suit. There is a calabari in John Nigel Delta, Nigeria saying that captures our thesis very well. And it says, if a monkey hand stays too long in a pot of soup, it will become a human hand. Another version puts it this way. If the human hand stays too long in the pot of soup, it becomes a piece of meat in the soup. You are indistinguishable from other chunks of meat in the pot. And another way to get a sense of a thesis is to what I call speculative ge genealogy of Adela Cruz's thesis. Adela Cruz's uh, theorization of identity and power in Nigeria Pentecostalism should remind us of the theory of symbol as put forth by thinkers like Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Frederick Schelling, and Paul Tillich. The theory of symbol is easy to grasp once you understand the distinction these scholars made between sign and symbol. A sign points, out to, points us to something. A symbol points to and participate in what it points. A road sign is merely an external sign 
and does not travel with you to your de destination. But the national flag is not just a sign of the country it represents. It also participates in the power and prestige of the country it represents. The flag cannot be separated from its reference. And that's what makes it a symbol. As, as Coleridge argues, the, the symbol, and I quote, always partakes of the reality which it renders intelligible. And while it enunciates the whole, abides itself as a living part of the unity of which it is representative, end of quote. In another place, Coleridge wrote, he perceives that the perfect symbol, I quote, lives within that which it symbolizes and resembles. As the crystal lives within the light it transmits and is transparent like the light itself, end of quote. The flag of the United States at the United Nations General Assembly does not only point observers to itself as a representative of the United States, but also participate in the glory and power of the world's strongest military and economic power. The practices, desires, and teachings of Nigerian Pentecostals do not only point them to the spiritual power, they also participate in it. They stand in, stand out, and stand for a divine power. That the philosophy of symbol is the background of actualization of identity of Nigerian Pentecostals is revealed in this quotation from our book. And she writes, he said, when the pastor said power is our identity, he meant that the faith movement's pursuit of goals through various rituals and social performances has over time become both their unique self-presentation and self-recognition, as well as their existential condition. Both their goals and conditions of their existence are reciprocal presuppositions that are diagrammed and performatively enacted by identity. Pentecostal identity not only points to this, but also participates in the power and glory. And this on, on, on from page six and seven, and it captures the theory of philosophy of symbols very well. Another way to look at our, our thesis is what I call the absent present theory in Adela Cruz's thesis. A question nagged me as I read Adela Cruz's book, how do persons who pursue power as a goal end up having power as their identity? She did not offer an explicit theory of how Pentecostals um, become constituted by their goals. She demonstrates how they pursue and perform the goal. But what exactly is the theoretical part from the pursuance of goal to identity? Though my, my resort to es explicating our theory in terms of the African social traditions and Western philosophy of symbol might sh shed some light in the directions of answers to this question. But it still begs for our attention. The ground idea of our thesis is that Pentecostals are constituted by their pursuit. Their subjectivity is not separate from their pursuit, not external to their identity. What then is the process, the route of mechanism, since persons are constituted only by their relationship and not by the objects of their interests? The objects they pursue is attained, maintained, and changed through relationship and other persons. The object of pursuit rises on and subsists in the relationship with others. Can a relationship with or pursuit of goals relating to objects such as tree, mountain, animals constitute the person? If you answered yes, what are you claiming here? How is this possible? Let us tackle this question in ways that can shed light on the unsaid theory of Adela Cruz. The value of relationship is not a function of the inherent properties or qualities of an object or a person, but the evaluation of the importance attached to the person or object. It is the cumulative estimation, esteem of the person or object that gives value to relationship. The estimation has both objective and subjective sides. Estimation by definition, estimation by definition has a fact, a given, and a reception. The recession itself is a relation of objectivity and subjectivity. A person, a teen event is understood, encountered, or received. Estimation becomes constitutive of identity when it is received. The importance of an object or a person is received by the subject. What a person, a living actuality, a power of being receives is both the potentiality and the actuality of relations, of relationship. This process of giving and receiving and recession includes participating knowledge. The person comes to know the object or persons of non, non, non knowledge, not only in calculating or analyzing way, 
but through the act of gnosis. It is, as Paul Tillich would say, a participating knowledge which changes both the knower and the known in the very act of knowledge, end of quote. For the Pentecostal in such a power, the exercise of our participation in power involves, and I quote him here again, the state of the whole person, all functions of the human mind and body are life in the very act. We can also dig for another theory to substantiate Adela thesis through what I've called elsewhere a relational team. This will mean that we must incorporate the role of object, things, and goals into the social relations of spiritual power. Identity is simultaneously a social relation and a relational team, a relation with things, objects, and goals. This is not only about the why and the how things or goals are used when power is performed, but also a way of relationship with persons and things. Relational team is the identification of a relationship in objects, things, or brute facts or goals. It is about how an object or goals empower performance and the social relations that constitute it as an identity confers it with identityness. Relational, re relational and team are not two separate items. They are like the two sides of a coin. The quest for power and the seeker are in a similar sense, two sides of the same coin. The quest for spiritual power is not something added to the identity uh, or to the person, or rather, which follows is the identity has no ontological being apart from the person's question. The person no, no, no longer exists in herself once she's incorporated into the social practices or performativity of the goal. It is also true that the quest cannot exist without the person. It is a relationship that makes any of them be, both the person and the quest to be. There is no time to discuss if Adela theorization of goal as identity will benefit from a comparison with, with Pierre Badiou habitus. Is identity as power not another name for habitus? At least, though, is it not conjure up the image of habitus? At another level, are you not nudged to read a copious description of some of the struggles of the pastors in the adaptation to the age of social media as Badiou hysteresis? It does to me, the missing definition of identity in the book. She does not offer a definition of identity in the book, though the thesis and almost all analysis are about identity. The French philosopher Alain Badiou offers this simple definition of identity. An identity is the series of characteristics and properties by which an individual or a group recognizes itself as itself. But what is this self? It is what across all characteristic properties of identity remains more or less invariable in the infinite webs of differences and their changes. It is possible then to say an identity is the abstract set of properties that support an invariance, end of quote. So the causal identity according to Adela Kuhn, is bound up with the invariable desire for power, spiritual power. In her book, she carefully analyzes things that are, uh, things that are bound with this implacable object of desire, those invariant properties of power, quest for power, maintenance of power, augmentation of, uh, augmentation of power that are, that are charismatic and must be incessantly performed. Identity as conceptualized above could be positive or negative. Positively, a group might assert its identity assent its invariant properties, maintaining and developing them. A group may also assert its identity in a negative way, demonstrating how it differs from others. Adela Kui in her book fo 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 focuses on both dimensions. She explains how, how lead leaders of Nigerian Pentecostal movement craft and deploy power as their prime identity and how their congregation is responding to their ways of being and enactment of power. She also offers subsit, subsit explanation of how Pentecostals deploy the identity against Muslims in contest for political power. Fragility and anti-fragility of Pentecostal identity. Adela Kuhn in her book discusses the fragility of Pentecostal's hold on power. As she put, 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 put this, and I quote, the social and ritual activities that engender their powers are transient, too fleeing and too variously challenged 
for it to be broadly accepted as a foregone conclusion. That fragility necessitates their performing power to sustain their perception as people of power. End of quote. Her argument is that the very character and logic of Pentecostalism and its leaders on ending quest for power and more power renders the life of power ever fragile. The leader, she argues, astutely draws from the ethos of freedom, creativity, novelty, and adaptability in the movement to manage or control the fragility of power. In presenting the fragility of power, what Adela Kru leaves untaught in her book, whole tantalizing clues to deepen our understanding of the implication of identity and power in Nigerian Pentecostalism. She did not examine the anti-fragility of power. She expertly recognized the fragile nature of Pentecostal power and examined the various practices performed by the leaders to render their power resilient and robust, not to break under pressure. Resilience and robustness are opposite ways to fragility. Anti-fragility is also opposite to fragility. As an opposite way to fra fragility, it may be used to characterize something that does not break under pressure. But anti-fragile is something that does not just break under stress or pressure, but actually benefits from and grows under pressure. Indeed, anti-fragility goes beyond resilience and robustness. A fragile system breaks under stress, disorders of volatility. An anti Fragile system does not only withstand shocks, stress, disorder, and uncertainty and volatility, but also benefits from them. Performing power does not examine the Pentecostal clergy power as a dynamical system that is always becoming and benefiting from contestation of its authority and power. And from the vulnerability, anxiety, and fear it imposes on all segments of its followers. The clergy power and identity resonance machine is in this sense, not different from the finance capital that imposes fragility on all spheres of society while it benefits from uncertainty and fragility. Another area I want us to look is what I call the weight of blackness versus the lightness of whiteness. Performing power makes an important discovery about Nigerian Pentecostal. It excavates a major transformation on how Nigerian Pentecostals incorporate the weight of blackness and interpretation of white privileges into their spirituality. Alas, but she did not explore this. Adela Kuh carefully lays out how Nigerian Pentecostals are being sold to what I will call lightness of whiteness. Whiteness is interpreted by many Nigerian Pentecostalism as an empowering agency that lifts nations lifts nations out of primitivity, po po uh, po po poverty, and underdevelopment into development and civilization. Whiteness to them also promotes Christian missions and takes a bold stand for Christianity and its moral values in the global public square. She argues that many Nigerian Pentecostals, and I quote, are very protective of maintaining Christianity whiteness to the efficacies, due to the efficacies of its accrued power in their engagement, that is in their engagement with Christian transnationalism, they look beyond whiteness as a color to engage with it as a troop that corresponds with a political and spiritual power. And this is from page 70 of our book, end of quote. Compare this finding about Nigerian Pentecostalism to that which I highlighted in my 2014 book, Nigerian Pentecostalism. In it, I demonstrate the case of the weight of blackness the weight of excessive sufferings that black Africans bear because of their skin color. I examine how Nigerian Pentecostals are deploying knowledge revelation received from the invisible God to manage or interpret the weight of blackness, consciously carrying the burden of blackness into their spirituality. They are using race as a lens to interpret their experiences, to interrogate the work of the Holy Spirit, to examine the burden of their skin pigmentation within the context of Pentecostal hermeneutics. Now, Nigerian Pentecostals are also redefining what it means to be black and how black should bear the weight of blackness in a world of historical contempt for black people. The difference between the views on spirituality and blackness as presented by Delacour and me in my 
uh, 14 book is remarkable and calls for explanation or dialogue. What has changed in the last seven years? What new trend has emerged as the quest for power and numinal knowledge intersects with Christian transnationalism? Maybe nothing new happened. The two books show the com com complexity of being a Nigerian Pentecostalism. They embody these two orientations. Method of reading Pentecostalism. Adelaku offers a distinct reading of Nigerian Pentecostalism that could double as a methodology of Pentecostal studies. I will name a reading as hermeneutics of performance. Its structure has six distinctive features. It is intimate, eminent, comparative, historical, con con constructive, and split. Intimacy. Ajilako offers a close and patient reading of the Pentecostal situation. Our description and analysis do not appear rushed, but detailed and informed. Eminent. She draws the terms of analysis, evaluation, and critique from the Nigerian Pentecostal world. A reading of Nigerian Pentecostal material is also comparative, meaning a presentation of the ideas, position, arguments, and judgments are often put in conversation with African traditional religions or indigenous worldviews. Her approach is also historical. Frequently, she painstakingly presents the historical paths certain Pentecostal arguments, positions, and performance have taken to be where they are today. An example you can see it on page 236. Fifth, her work is constructive. She seeks to build a coherent theoretical meaning-making framework for interpreting the connection between Nigerian Pentecostal identity and power. Finally, our analysis, our analysis identified an unfathomable X that disturbs or undermines the smooth operation of any identity or system. No self or system is self-identical. Every system, even reality, is imperfect and incomplete. Cracks, fissures, and, and fragilities appear in every system fun functioning or being which its poesis of performance covers up or converts into a source of creativity or no, no, novelty. Performance is a significant way to understand the peculiar relationship between systems and splits, even as it has the capacity to initiate something new amid ongoing processes. Now, let me conclude. In sum, Adela who presents a thesis as an a thesis on implication of power and identity as the imminent logical principle of Pentecostal existence in Nigeria. Power transmuted into or transmogrified as identity is the transcendental of, of Pentecostal world. Is, it, it structures the whole of their imagination. The primary contribution of our book is the, is the key question it raises and addresses. And this is, the question is, under what circumstances, uh, does the objectivity of an object of pursuit becomes the condition of the subject of the subject that of the Pohoshua? Adelako offers a rigorous response to this question in the context of Nigerian Pentecostalism. I will sum our response in this way. Power or identity is an eminent human activity, not a real predicate. It is performance of a position or position of an object or certain possibilities in themselves. Adelaku argues that Nigerian Pentecostals are, and I quote, constantly in, in a performative mood as they position themselves against the other. The power identity, unlike identities based on physical characteristics or marked in material ways, cannot be taken for granted because it is frequently challenged and has to be continuously performed to be sustained. End of quote. This portrayal of power identity raises two questions. One, doesn't this understanding of sustenance of power identity cause into question her definition of power as the ability to do or act on page, uh, uh, in pages 12 to 14? Her findings seems to suggest that the Anaherian, Aherian definition of power as collective actions by members of a community to sustain or transform their shared world, which cannot be stored as an authority, but recreated as often as they need it, it's more appropriate for a study. My point is that if you have used Aryan definition of power, it will have worked better than the Weberian other form of power as an ability to do. 
Two, will not the very acceptance of performance as integral or intrinsic to power itself, not undercut our claim of performance as something that is perpetually wielding from outside to sustain power identity of Nigerian Pentecostal. My point is that if performance is what they do all the time, it's no more an outside thing, it's, it's, it's what they do, right? More importantly, what Adela Cook considers as relentless performance of power identity might not be more than the Pentecostal self-existence moving beyond its actual givenness to its presently absent possibilities. That is to say, they are always trying to actualize their possibilities. What she called performance, some of that scholar, like in philosophy, would say they're actualizing their possibilities or potentialities. And of course, this move, move, movement necessarily involves failures, challenges, and contestation, as that of any being Daisy. What if what she has named as performance is only the normal work of a self or a group or a group of person always interpreting itself in the light of its possibilities? What if performance itself is a form of embodiment and actualization of the Pentecostal principle, the capacity to consider one's own existence always as a, as a potentiality? To be able to perform an identity, I must first be a self who is able to perform a being, a design with the power of always transcending myself towards my possibility. We should think of Pentecostal identity as a permanent subsistence and uh, we should think of Pentecostal identity less as a permanent subsistence and more as a horizon of possibility. It is both actuality and possibility, present and future. Pentecostal identity is not a predicate. Its performance is not performation or pre-formation of an essence or a completion of an act. I have raised, this is my last paragraph. I have raised more questions that I've answered in my address. This is because all good books like Adela Cons compels us to ask fresh questions to further actualize their thoughts. To further actualize their thoughts or to recognize or excavate the key dimensions of their own discoveries that their authors missed. Slova Zizak once said that what characterizes a great, a really great thinker is that they misrecognize the basic dimensions of, our, of their own breakthrough. And I think this book has made a breakthrough and therefore it provokes certain questions that I've asked. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Professor Wariboko. I, I must first admit that that took all of my breath away. And if I can't find the words to respond, <laughs> you must forgive me. Honestly, I, I can't say anything right now. <laughs> uh, seriously, I am very grateful to you for all the insights that you have shared. These are really important, not only for me to just for think again about this book, but also going forward and to um, revise my ideas, to sharpen my thoughts, I mean, you know, finesse you know, this project as I go forward. And I assure you that I'll be thinking about a lot of these things in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. Um, first, I, in my response, I should note that I began to, you know, this, I embarked on this project to study the Pentecostal movement around 2013. Under the scholarly, and I must also add, the moral direction of my advisor, Dr. Omi Oshun Jones. And um, I wanted to understand what makes Pentecostal so phenomenal and how that phenomenality plays out in social culture. But then I ended up writing about power identity after I encountered a minister in Ogun State who told me, power is our identity. It led me into thinking about why and every one of their religious activity frequently boils down to obtaining power. You know, we are either exercising power over demonic forces or commanding the power of the heavens or asking for power to change hands. 
So there is a preoccupation with performing power in the name of Jesus and the resultant fixation on being the person who self-identifies with power and who has the capability to make things happen also led me to exploring other aspects beyond dominance and control to the dimensions of Pentecostal sociality. Within the context of our African state and the relatively weak institution, power identity can also be a form of self-discovery, self-assertion, and of course, self-definition, all of which gets diffused into everyday culture. This sublimation, of course, always anticipates and confronts the contestations and negotiation of power. Some of what you will see in the book is, and which Professor Wariboko has very well demonstrated, is how those contests come to play in practical terms for a culture where the ideas of power and empowerment are quite central. So I'll respond to two of Dr. Wariboko's questions and um, I'll leave room for the audience to add theirs or take on, you know, as they wish. And so I'll bunch the two, uh, two into the two questions in my response. The first is how the persons who pursue power as a goal end up having power as their identity. And the second concerns the issue of race, nationalism and power. Now, the first question is really important because it goes straight to the heart of theories and power and subjectivity, you know, the likes of which, you know, we've read in uh, whether it's Foucault or to Judy Butler. And Butler's thesis actually even approached the question from the aspect of conscience and consciousness. In some ways, Dr. Barry Foucault's book also prefigures the question he asked because he, some of the things he has explained in his book, Nigerian Pentecostalism, is to note that. Pentecostalism is a mode of working on the body. So these questions are already, you know, uh, these answers are already there. But I think what I can add at this point is that there is no definite des destination for a self-definition that revolves around power. There's no ending up. It's a continuous process of affirming that power. The social and political context that people inhabit makes the definition of the self as distinctive and ideologically make it ideologically strategic and making a power identity is one's communicative self also becomes quite necessary. But I think that since my focus area of focus is Nigeria, I also think it's equally crucial to note that an answer like this must critically engage the question of why they even pursue a power identity in the first place and what they have when they believe that they have attained it. Do they develop anything tangible or is it vicariously derived from watching other people use the power on their behalf. And so unpacking that question will also lead me to the second one, and which is another very important issue, which is the question of the weight of blackness versus the lightness or whiteness. And thank you for bringing up that part. Uh, you know, when I was working on that, I noted that this is an area that is still very much unfolding, and these issues will reverberate in the coming years. While writing on that aspect, I was thinking that this chapter only begins what would be a long conversation on how what the factor that this French theorist, Jean Bayard, calls the resources of externality, how it shows up the power identity of the Nigerian Pentecostal subject. And what I noted in the book is that when they find their con the, the constituent of the identity threatened, threatened within the instability of the Nigerian national democratic structure, they look at what I call the trans spaces. You know, whether it's transcendental or transnational, these are sources of boosting the power identity. And central to the attitude of this looking into central trans spaces, and which I, which is why I said it's going to be a very long converse, scholarly conversation, is the alternative power structure that digital technology now facilitates, and which has allowed people to take certain initiatives outside the monopolistic control of the state and in fact, imperil the stability of the power complex that religious and political leaders have always tried to build. When Ruth Marshall, who is also another political theorist who has studied Nigerian Pentecostalism, when she looked at this Pentecostal transnational formation at the very early stages, she saw the potential of that kind of exposure for tents for the Pentecostal movement. And then now more than 20 years later, I think I also should admit that the exposure has taken very interesting turns and has also become an overexposure. And one of the fallouts of this overexposure is what I address in the book, and which is that the unbearable likeness of whiteness also makes people conflate bearing the cross of Jesus Christ with the moral burdens of whiteness that intertwines with it. I think this is a significant historical and cultural development, and it will continue to generate scholarly dialogues in the coming years. 
we're only getting only just getting started on addressing the issues of the weight of blackness and the lightness of whiteness in politicization of faith and there's a world of infinite possibilities ahead of us this is especially also because the race and nationality politics of the time is intricately interwoven with religion and it continues to define extant progressive and conservative politics and policies the potency of this politics means as we go forward there will be so much blurring of the differences between discrete categories and those of us that are interested in these issues from the academic point of view and for whatever disciplinary angle need to continually sharpen our analytical tools to grapple with how certain signs and symbols in the practices of faith become increasingly amenable to serving certain political purposes. And now I want to emphasize a few things before I end this. One is that this book also represents part of my optimism about what people can achieve if they have faith. I consider faith a, an inalienable moral and spiritual force that can be very emboldening. And I can relate an example from a journalistic account I share with my students when we talk about African churches in the diaspora. So many years ago, around 2005, the Nigerian Pentecostal de denomination, the Redeemed Christian Church of God, they were gonna set up this ambitious church book project in a rural part of Texas called Huntsville. This town has a very racist history. And one of the ways they used to describe themselves is that they are the blackest land of the whitest people. And this Nigerian church chose of all the places in the world that land as the proposed site for their structure. The project was ambitious because it was supposed to accommodate like 10,000 people you know, when they have their services. But the people of the town who also noted that they are very Christian opposed the project. They said they did not want the character of their town changed with the influx of so many people. And some of them explicitly admitted that they don't even want 10,000 black people in their community. The journalist that wrote the article went to the Nigerians and asked them if they knew the history of the town and what they plan to do if they bring the KKK against them. The pastor said, let them come. As they ride out, we too will ride out to meet them in the name of Jesus. And I'm sharing this story, and I like sharing this story because it typifies an attitude and ethic that several studies of the African Pentecostal diaspora have encapsulated about our churches and the incredible strength of will that people display because of their faith in sacred power. But in my conception of power, the power of faith is not limited to religious devotion that drives power identity alone, but also the faith that structures of power any form of power, whether political or spiritual, can also be contended and most importantly, demystified and even possibly redistributed. I know this sounds Arantian as Dr. Wariboko noted that much, but also represent the degree of my enthusiasm about the infinite potentials that are attainable when faith mediates human action. I have a lot of faith in what people can achieve when they look beyond their obvious reality and reach into the trans spaces, the realms where they find a source of power that helps them surpass all forms of oppressive powers. That is why in much of this book, I get an account of the meaningful threats people have posed to establish power structure. That is why I also look at the activities of religion that do not fall into familiar practices that take place within sacred sites or follow certain conventions of how religion is defined. I hope that by reflecting these dynamics, people can be buoyed to contend with structures of power that have become decimating and work towards their self-redemption. In closing, I want to thank um, the John Warfield Center for this opportunity. I want to thank you, Dr. Wariboko, for such an elaborate and very insightful analysis of my book. Uh, a few times I was listening and thinking, is that the same book he's still talking about? Thank you. It's, it, go, it says a lot about your power of analysis that you are able to, you know, to do this broader overview of my work. And I'm really grateful for that. So thank you very much. And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Dr. Adela Kuhn, and thank you, um, Dr. Wari Boko. Um, so we have plenty of time for discussion of this um, important new book and this thought-provoking um, intervention. So I encourage you uh, to put your questions in the chat. Um, I think we are a small enough group that I can also scroll through uh, the two screens to look for raised hands. But if you would, please raise your hand if you would like to ask your question directly, that will help me 
um, spot uh, you uh, amongst the Zoom boxes, but please let's engage um, with our uh, featured scholars for uh, the day on this uh, important new publication. Dr. Falala put some questions in the chat. Should we go to that, those ones? Oh, thank you, Dr. Adela Kuhn. Um, so yes, um, so Dr. Toyin Falola um, notes, the book's relevance has become enhanced in various ways uh, to which you both can respond to. One, the current vice president's interest, Pastor Professor Osin Bajo, is to become president can Pentecostalism move to the ultimate seat of power? And to what extent will this generate a serious crisis in the polity? Second, if Pentecostalism creates access to money, how do its core practices uh, differ from ritual means to make money? Is ritualized Pentecostalism and ritualized money dissimilar? Um, and then third, and let me know that I'm happy to have you answer the first question and restate the subsequent questions. Third, what is wrong with God if he makes himself too accessible to humans to turn into fiction? That's a lot. Thank you very much for, for, for your wonderful questions. That, that's a lot. I will attempt some, and I know that um, Professor Waribuko has I'm sure he has something to say about them too. And uh, first question about the, um, whether the, a pastor, professor can become president. I think that remains in the realm of possibility, which Dr. Wariboko mentioned now, you know, that it's very, quite very possible because for a movement that have millions of members, first of all, it's a statistical probability that they could produce a member but of course, we know it's not just only about figures, but the ways they, um, they tenaciously work towards obtaining political power. And um, it's, it's really central to everything Pentecostal, Pentecostalism, that you have that ultimate prize, the presidency. And I think so that, yes, it will eventually, it's, it, even if it doesn't happen during this present political dispensation, it's only a matter of time before that happens. And so we, we only need to wait and see. And I don't think it will generate a serious crisis in the polity as much as the fact that it will awaken or conscientize other religious group who will also begin to mobilize based on the identity. Now, there is so much, um, I would say some form of moral panic that, oh, this person that represents, you know, that is a pastor in a church can become president and what it means for, you know, occupying places of power. And it's, if it's causing a lot of, I know, discussions and dialogues within Nigeria, but I don't see it in the realm of crisis as much as the fact that it will lead into the same politics of revanchism that, you know, we deal with in Nigeria, whereby somebody gets into power begins to um, allocate resources to members of their own uh, community. And so other people do that at, you know, at other kinds of, at their own levels too. And that's the, that's the continuous cycle that I see. Not as if, it's a crisis in itself. It's a democratic crisis, but not in the terms of whether it can lead to violence or a civil war, as some people have said. I find that as just mere moral panic. And two, the question of if Pentecostalism creates access to money, how does this, I, I, how, you know, how does it differ from ritual means to make money? Um, I think how Pentecostalism creates access to money is basically through what the uh, Komarov and Komarov in the sense, in one sense is they call the occult economy, the whole idea of being part of a group where um, morals can be adjourned, processes can be adjourned and the, um, the work that leads to production, you know, can be erased and money made through th those magical means. And I think, yes, it's, it, it's, that's, um, it's not dissimilar from what you call the ritualized uh, money in the sense that if you really look at it too, a lot of what constitutes African Pentecostalism has appropriate a lot you know, from African traditional religion, 
whether in his theology, through his practices, they go through all of this, right? So there is so much mimicking of those traditional African religion. And so, yes, you are right in that, you know, to, to that extent that in what way is it different? It's not quite different, but of course it also, it's also different in the fact that it, um, it's, it's processes are uh, much, um, I'm trying not to just only just to leave it at to say that they only mimic African traditional religions. They they um, they use their methods. They or let's just say that the cosmo the African cosmology where all of us you know where we were socialized, you know, I, 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 I structure certain kinds of expectations, ideas of how the supernatural operates, and so it comes out as either Islam or Christianity or African traditional religion. But you see a lot of that in Pentecostalism. I think, yeah, that's it's it's not really dissimilar. It's very similar, and I think a lot of it goes back to you know the way Africans conceive how um, money or you know capital can be generated. You know, I don't know whether Dr. Wariboko wants to say something. Um, really, not in. Um to add, um, I have to say that I'm not holding my breath thinking that a Pentecostal uh, president of Nigeria will make much of a difference. Because um, as we know, such a person most likely will be captured by the state power, by the bourgeois interests that have always um, manipulated power in Nigeria. So. I don't see one person getting there would suddenly make um, make a difference. It's, it's, it's an illusion for for them to think that they will just uh, go there as, as make a difference. And at the end of the day, it's going to be just Pentecostalism, as as the politicians have always used re re religion as an instrument of class struggle, or as an instrument of a way to mobilize people for political power. So Pentecostalism would just be a manifestation of that. It is already that. And this is what um, Obadere have shown in his um, um, uh, Pentecostal Republic. So there is really nothing. Different people will use different facade, different ways of presenting that, um, that, 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 that themselves. So, uh, and again, we've seen in other uh, places like in Zambia and other, other places where Pentecostals have re re risen to the top, they've not made any significant difference to think that because you are a politician, you are a Pentecostal, you are going to be any, um, you're going to be a different leader in the world. You've got to have it yourself. Just being a Pentecostal would not um, give you that um, a, a privilege or that, that uh, preference or whatever to say, I'm going to be a better leader. So, so if somebody emerges as a good or bad leader, Eventually, it's not going to be because of their Pentecostalism. It's the ability to master the machinery of state and navigate it and survive, um, um, uh, 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 survive in it. And we are paying much attention to that because of the corrupt situation in Nigeria. And we are thinking that, oh, if somebody comes from maybe a religious background, he or she might be different. But we've been disappointed over and over again. So uh, there is no better breath here waiting to a sale because mm -hmm. somebody uh, bears the um, the crown or whatever of, of Pentecostalism, um, yeah, or so. And then in terms of uh, rituals or or um, access to money, yeah, Pentecostalism through uh, prosperity gospel also fuels this need to say you have to be materialistic, you have to have money. So in that underlying ethos. They are not different from from the people that that go to uh, commit murders for ritual. The ethos is the same. In one, you 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 give the money to um, to a pastor or to a church. In another one, you, you make some sacrifices of of whatever. But the the thing that drives what is happening is the same basic ethos of looking for money in all mm -hmm. places. And because the Nigerian state is in a crisis. And so when people are in a, in, in, in a crisis, this kind of attitude of, I will do everything to survive becomes um, 
very, very, very paramount. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so that is what, what is happening. And like I said in my address, that even um, I wish um, Dr. Della could have addressed this issue, that the, the fact that the Pentecostal pastors are not just responding to issues, they, they have this character of anti-fragility, means they benefit from the context of their power, from the crisis that other people buckle under. And I said, how is that different from finance capitalism? So, so it's, it's a way just like Wall Street will always strive and the rest of us have problems. But next year, next time, the Dow Jones will always be better. And Pentecostal pastors, at least, have found a way to survive in that country. And so it, uh, whether money ritual, any other ritual they can come up with, it will be just one of those arsenal in their uh, in their stuff, and the issue of why God um, will be so eminent, um, uh, so much so that people will make a fish a fission of God. God is is eminent, that is true, and so you can either look at God as completely transcendental in some uh, in some tradition, even within Christianity, the Calvinist thinks that God is very transcendental, or you can look at God as eminent, or you can take a middle position, what you call trans, uh, trans eminence, right? God is both transcendental and eminent. And that is the nature of God. Whether people will make a fiction of God does not depend on whether God is transcendental or eminent. Or if you look at religious history, people have always made a fiction of God. And that is why the German philosopher in the 19th century, Feuerbach said, what we conceive of God often is a projection of our earthly ideals of the things that we want to deal with. And so people will always create a God, most times in their own image. So we are told by the Christian Bible, the Jewish Bible, that God created us in our own, in, his, in God's image. But often in reality, in practical terms, we human beings will create God in God's image. In the same way, whether God is transcendental or not, the racist, white supremacists created God, Jesus Christ, in their own image. A part of the problem we have in Africa is, is that we are, we've not done enough to create God in our own image, in the sense that to reflect on God in a way that will, will speak to our own conditions. So the issue is not whether God is transcendental or not. Human beings will always make, quote unquote, a fiction of God. And that's why my great friend Falu, uh, Gum once told me a story. He said his father gave him this uh, uh, proverb, African proverb, that there's a reason he said God is invisible. He said, if God were to be completely visible as a human being, he said human beings would hold God on the street and tear him apart for, or tear her apart for all the issues involved in life. So God shows to be invisible. So since we cannot get a, a, a pound of flesh from God for all the sufferings and the injustice and all the things we are saying, then we tend to create the God that will suit us and speak to us. And that is not dependent on, on, a, on whether a God is transcendental or immanent. It's just the way once you, you land on the notion of a God, you are, no matter what people say, ignore their, their piousness or so, there is a way the notion of God always reflects where the people are. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to move to uh, the chat. So I'm keeping track of the queue. Um, so I'll take a question from Marlon Milner in the chat, and then we'll um, hear from Professor Oyewumi. Uh, Marlon Milner asks, staying, uh, excuse me, um, does largely African-American centric black critical thought offer a different reading practice of this book? Here, I think about the use of trans as above or over, whereas trans, say through black trans or gender thought, thinks about undoing, underdoing fugitivity. Thus, with Judith Butler, does Nigerian Pentecostalism always or predominantly show up as reiter reiterative performance or does it ever break accepted performance? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for that question, Marlon. I, I think first is that um, it doesn't always show up as a reiterative performance. 
um, even though it is continuous and affirming, but it also doesn't show up like that. And, and methodologically, it would be a problem to us to, you know, to frame that it's constantly merely reiterate, because at some point it will look as if they are, you know, stuck in history or that they are not, um, it's not dynamic. It's, it's, it's the practice is much too dynamic and it's always, you know, you know, novel, it's playful, it's performative, and all of those factors always, always result in these places where uh, the practices, you know, there are breaks in, in all these liminal breaks that disrupt power, the structures of power, it, it sometimes could reaffirm it. And what you find several times is also that the clergy power always trying to um, harness some of those breaks in accepted performances. And I think one of the examples I can give you is from the book itself about the uses of comedy in church. It's a very, um, it's a practice that is considered rather, um, it's a rupture, you know, of the kind of ways that church is expected to be, to have somebody, a stand-up comedian in church. But what they are trying to do is also to harness the kind of power of um, the disruptiveness of comedy, you know, comedy that we believe that it can stand up to or it can challenge access, accepted power structures and, you know, and to bring it inside the church, to use it to reaffirm. And that's because they understand that there are certain kinds of breaks, you know, that can threaten the whole structure of Pentecostal power. So it does not always show up in that reiterative performance, but it has all of these, you know, moments of liminal breaks and where things change. And in this sense, if we say we want to use African-American centric critical thought, I will look at works of uh, my advisor, Dr. Jones, who has um, work on theatrical jazz. And the aspect of it, I always go back to uh, is that point of the break. When there is a break from you know, the pattern of the familiar, things change, things get disrupted. And we, I cannot, um, you know, for Pentecostals, it ultimately works in several ways, whether it disrupts accepted power structure or, you know, or reaffirms it, but there's always that moment of, you know, breaking the accepted performance. Thank you. Professor Oyewumi. Yes. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Very clearly. Good afternoon, Adunioki. Yes. Congratulations on this wonderful book. And thank you, Professor Wariboko, for your analysis. I've got what I call maybe three small questions. The first one is the smallest. Why Nigeria? Is this analysis you did, this development you are able to track in like 300 pages, is it peculiar to Nigeria? How is it different from other African countries, number one? And I wonder what it also has in common with evangelicalism in the US or in Brazil. So I'm just inviting you to, do, to, to give us a little sense of the comparison with other places. That's my first question. My second question is, um, I would want you to comment a little further on your use of power, because a whole lot of things are not clear to me. I'm asking power for what? All their performance, power for, for what? Against whom? For whom? I understand at this very moment, that we have a vice president who is a Pentecostalist. One can overtly say, oh, okay, maybe they were going towards political power, but this is just about now, before now. What was that whole performance? I'm sure you, you, you've written it in the book, but I haven't read the book. What is their performance of power towards what? That's one question I want you to clarify. And then, um, and then, of course, along those lines too, what sorts of distinctions do they make or even do we make between spiritual and political power? 
other forms of power. In an African setting, is it okay to set spiritual power aside as one kind of power? And then there are other kinds. I'd love for you to comment on that. And then finally, I appreciate uh, your comment about the fact that whether it's the so-called money ritual of African traditions or the money rituals of the church, from your perspective, and I tend to agree with you, Abimbola, that they seem to all be cut from the same cloth. And one of the things I have noticed about churches, Christian churches in Nigeria, in Africa, is the degree to which they appropriate and plagiarize tradi traditions, our African traditions, without much credit. The only time African traditions come up, usually, is when they want to demonize it. When they don't want to demonize it, the Africa drops out and they love it and they play the drums and all that. So I wonder if you could comment on why it is that in their bid to demonize Yoruba traditions, for example, part of what I hear in some of their rhetoric is that these Yoruba traditions are very spiritually powerful. And then you hear a lot of people say, even the pastor went to see a traditional spiritualist, right? So it's clear that they recognize there's power there. So for people who want to perform power constantly, it's right there under their nose. Why do they have to cross the Atlantic to look for power, especially since they've gestured towards the powerfulness of our traditions? And I wonder, finally, I'm going to stop, whether this demonization of Yoruba traditions, for example, that many of them do, maybe not all of them, but it is quite distinct. Does it have to do with fear of competition? Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. That's quite a bunch, and um, I'll try to pick it one I take them one after the other. Uh, the first one is why Nigeria? I will answer that as a simply practical because that's that's where I am pretty familiar with. And yes, you are absolutely right that to ask if it's peculiar and whether there are similarities elsewhere. Yes, there are a lot of similarities with the way Pentecostalism manifests in Nigeria with other places, whether in Africa, or in, even in Latin America, or even in part of Asia, like South Korea, there are lots of similarities. I, for instance, in one of the things that I also found, you know, looking within Africa itself is that there are several people even look up to Nigerian Pentecostal preachers, you know, where they, they consider them like um, the, you know, the, the great preachers, the great African preachers. So, they borrow a lot of ideas, borrow words, borrow language, borrow worship songs, borrow a lot of things, books and so on. So it's also very influential. Like when you travel to outside of Nigeria, you go to other places in Africa, you find a lot of Nigerian influences in their Pentecostal practice. And um, the way Pentecostalism operates, yes, is very similar to the way it is in places like Brazil and conversations are ongoing all the time. And some of the issues you raised about their interactions with African traditional religions, you find that even in you know, those Latin American countries, the politics they play, the nationalism politics they also play and their demonization of Afro diasporic practices are always there. So while there is um, there are similarities, there are also some kind of contextual differences. You know, it's not exactly that uniform, but there is, um, there is that um, aspect, you know, similarity. And uh, what does it have in common with evangelicalism in the US? Yeah, it's also very similar, even though I later learned that Pentecostalism and evangelicalism are not exactly conceived the same way in the US, but in terms of practices, in terms of politics, yeah, they are quite similar. 
And then um, what sort of distinctions do they make between spiritual and political power? I will say, and part of the things that I recognize is that power is first of all power, right? And so it, it, there is no that much distinction in terms of like, this is political power, this is spiritual power. They think of power as, this, as a thing in this objectified means. And sometimes you, you, so when you are thinking of political issues, they could put it in spiritual frameworks, you know, to contend it, to um, deal with it. And then you find a lot of that in spiritual rights like prayers, even when they are dealing with political issue, they commute them into spiritual way frameworks. They generate demonic characters or spirit characters through which they address all of these issues. You see that in their narration. So it's very much, um, these things are very much a composite, you know, the, the idea of power, you know. And I think um, part of uh, Dr. Wariboko's book on Nigerian Pentecostalism has addressed some of these issues from this, the political ontologies of spiritual power and political power and how the ways it operates in, in Nigerian culture you know, the absence of the lack of transparency, the ability to withhold things, the person that can redact, you know, processes that can, you know, um, make things invisible, you know, or you can work with the power of invisibility, that is, is part of their ways of understanding power. And so the other question that you asked about appropriation and plagiarizing of African traditional religion, and believe me, I come across this all the time, and one of the things, one of the ways that I prefer to express it is that they are constantly in a dialogue with African traditional religion. Because when you really look at it, that, you know, on the surface, it looks at, they definitely demonize African traditional religion, but they also heavily rely on the mythologies, on the imagination in order to create Pentecostalism. And then you find that in almost everywhere that Pentecostalism, um, the context where Pentecostalism operates, you always find that dimension where they have to continue to project things on African traditional religion. Sometimes you have to, you know, you, you come up with stories, you borrow their myth, their, their conception of the supernatural, and then you use that to further generate the character of Pentecostalism. So both of them are deeply, deeply intertwined in ways that you cannot easily extricate them. And I think that um, part of the ways that in the, I want to look at it in the positive sense, there, there is a negative sense of demonization, which I oppose. But I also want to look at it in the positive sense that there is an expansion of the, um, our indigenous repertoire of thoughts, of the supernatural, of mythologies, through all of these stories that they are telling, this constant interaction. It's not going to kill African traditional religion because it continues to expand their power you know, in, in the imagination. And that's why you have people that they might go to church in the morning, especially in Southwest Nigeria. They still look at these African traditional religions as exceedingly powerful. They still patronize them because part of the ways this operates is the way the, in religious circles where they keep talking about how much power to the um, to the supernatural, the access to the supernatural that indigenous traditions have, and which you know, which continues to make um, people to think that these people have some form of power. So it's not going to go away. It's not going to destroy it. It's just continuing to expand the repertoire of the kind of stories that we can tell. And I feel this is probably long term, but over time, some of these stories will eventually you know emerge in public. Um, imagination, like the ways African traditional religion think of the supernatural, the way Christianity will eventually become unified stories. So I don't think of it in entirely negative sense, even though I understand the politics of it, but it, that's it. And why did they have to cross the Atlantic for power when they, they believe something like that happens? I think I think that has a very long history of our, you know, our 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 ideas, and like Jean Bryan said about looking for resources of externality to constantly to add to the things that we have to look outside. Now you might even think of newer formations that are coming up now, like Africans that consider themselves as Jews and practicing Judaism, and you know, and using that as part of ways of 
defining themselves within Nigerian political space. And I think it's always about reaching to another level, another places that are not familiar, you know, to, uh, to constitute the self within the Nigerian democratic polit uh, polity. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you. So the chat is overflowing with a bounty of questions in the interest of accessibility. I'm going to prioritize those who are asking questions for the first time. So James Yeku writes, Dr. Abimbola, thanks for an amazing book. I wonder if you could talk a little about digital performances of Pentecostalism that push back against pastoral power, both in Nigeria and maybe the black church more broadly. I am thinking about, for instance, social media influencers, for example, Daddy Freeze, whose authority and prestige online confronts the normative power of the pastor class. Thanks again for a great book. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Yeku. I, I really, I'm, I might sound biased, but I think the um, digital technology is one of the most significant um, things that have happened in, you know, the Pentecostal culture, and I'm not, this is not technological determinism. This is as a result of my interactions with um, churches and they are very conscious of what people can do on social media. There is an, uh, there, there is an understanding of destabilization of their power and the kind of influence they wield and what the people can do on social media. You know, you might, so the, even in, um, some months ago that was in a church, one of the, we, we had this long time where they kept me waiting somewhere while they called this person, called that person in, and eventually the woman that had kept me from, you know, accessing an archive, she said, I don't know if, if you take a picture here, it ends up on social media, a lot of things just could go wrong. And that's part of, you know, the ways that they, everything they do, they are very self-conscious about how people, the fact that they cannot control certain narratives. I think that's very integral to notice about the evolution of the movement itself. And um, yeah, I, it's, it's the ways that people that are social media influencers are now using them uh, to, to develop social media content to challenge their power and you know, their authority. And that for me, I find that very exciting in the sense that we, it allows a kind of reformation and some, you know, some of people even speak to it, that it allows the reformation of some of their practices. You are very conscious that you can be criticized by people that are not even believers. You could be subjected to all kinds of trolling and you can, you can be taken down, you know, so, so many times it's, they find it embarrassing. They, and so you have to constantly to deal with that reality a lot. And I think that's about, one of the positive development. It's like I said, it redistributes power. Whether it can, on the long term, you know, do a lot of damage remains to be seen, but it's a very significant development. They react to it, they plan around it. You have pastors preaching in someone and saying things like, I know if this gets on social media, it's going to become a problem. The fact that they are haunted by what people can do online, it's a very significant way that, you know, challenge to the construct of their power. Thank you. Dr. Kossi Chernyshev asks, what role does prophecy or the prophetic play in African Pentecostalism with regards to the election of political leaders? Oh, a lot of role, you know, there was a time that power, uh, and I think again, that role is moderated by now by the kind of pushbacks that you get from the public. There was a time that a preacher, a very famous preacher talked about, said somebody was going to win an election and the kind of pushback they got um, made, now make, you know, they, they, they pull back a little bit on prophecy and, you know, make them um, prophesying victory. But it, the, the ways they try to influence, the moral influence is still very much there. It, it's not, it, they, they, you see a lot of that, whether it's about in praying, for a candidate, you don't even need to endorse the person. You don't have to say anything. The person just comes to church and then they kneel before the pastor. You pray for them, and you know it amounts to some kind of endorsement in, in uh, within the political space. 
Now, all of those things are now, because sometimes you, we've had cases, and this is very well dealt with in the book that Professor Wariboko mentioned earlier, the Pentecostal Republic, where an anointed candidates, that's the language they use in Nigeria, now become so corrupt, so embarrassing that the person's um, political failure or inefficacy now uh, bounces back on the church and the clergy power that endorsed them. So you, I think that going forward, especially since we have a major election in 2023, some of them might be more careful in calibrating their role. But of course, what is at stake is very complex. It's very, these are high stakes politics, you know, that determines a lot of things. So they, you, they will continue to always, you know, that influence will always be there. Okay, so I regret saying this, but we have time for one final question. Um, and so Tim Wang writes, how is Pentecostalism distinguished between other faith movements in Nigeria? Is it a distinct denomination with specific structures of authority or is it a more organic movement? Do individuals identify with Pentecostalism more generally or Pentecostal churches or leaders more specifically? Um, okay, so I think first is a faith movement, and um, it has long history, which it, it's split into, um, you know, I, I don't want to get into the question, the longer history, but the long and short of it is that it is a movement that became really, um, um, that expanded around the 1970s and the 80s, and a lot of it has to do with it. They evolved from certain kinds of, um, the, you know, the church movements that already existed. And some of them also have to do with the bridging of words to technology and opportunities to connect with people from different everywhere. So it's, yeah, it's a really organic movement that you know, rose at different, um, you know, they, they has come a long way from the seventies to present time. And some of the ways they acquired their, um, their force have also have to do with Nigerian politics. As Nigerian politics evolved, they evolved with it. And uh, one of the stories I like to tell is that in, when Nigeria was under the very, very, this very brutal autocratic military leader, one of um, a preacher, one of the most famous one, prayed, said, God says that there is going to be a turn. It's a happy new year, Nigeria. And then I think he said it on Friday and by Monday, the leader just died. Like nobody knew what happened to him. I mean, there are all kinds of story, but there's no official. And people say, oh, it is the pre this preacher that prophesied his death. God showed it to him. And you know, that kind of coincidence goes a long way in cementing or affirming this preacher's you know, power. And so that's part of the, those are the kind of, activities, political activities within the Nigerian sphere that expanded the movement generally. And so do individuals identify with Pentecostalism more generally or churches? I will say all of above. Um, what you might see in Nigeria right now is um, what a fluidity. You know, people might identify with a particular church, but they also go to other churches where you, you know, they are in search of um, some customized experience. Let me put it that way. I have been in a place where you, you know, you have a pastor that says, oh, people go to so-and-so church in the morning because they want to appear like these genteel middle-class people. They go to places where they are praying quietly or they, you know, and then in the evening when they really need power, the source of power, they come here where we pray fire prayers. So you might have people that, you know, that move around like that because it's, it's also a fluid movement. They call it church hopping now, but yeah, do you see that? Do you want to say something, Dr. Wariboko? No. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, but that's, um, that's the way it is. People identify with the faith, the movement generally, and sometimes they could be devoted to a church. Sometimes it's just that they are hopping through places, you know, looking for a, a power that manifests in particular phenomenal ways. Thank you, um, everyone. Thank you to our guests for your thoughtful engagement today. Thank you, Dr. Wari Boko, for launching this conversation with your insightful analysis. And please, everyone, join me again in congratulating Dr. Adela Kuhn 
on the publication of Performing Power in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, there's information on how you can um, secure your own copy of Performing Power in Nigeria in the chat if you haven't already. Um, and um, thank you all uh, for coming and take care. Thank you.